Command and Conquer was originally released in 1995 and redefined the RTS genre. Games such as Warcraft and Starcraft further enhanced that path and laid a foundation of what would become a blueprint of future strategy games. Wastewood Studios went on to release many more Command and Conquer titles even after the purchase by EA Games and the inevitable closure of Wastewood Studios. EA Games also developed a number of Command and Conquer games under their own umbrella before the eventual death of a franchise. However, with the remaster of Command and Conquer on the way, we have to look at the life and death and eventual rebirth of Command and Conquer. Installation complete. Well, my name is Lewis Castle. I'm the Vice President of Creative Development for Electronic Arts Los Angeles, and I'm the co-founder of Westwood Studios, which created Command & Conquer. I didn't think that I'd ever be into video games as a business, but uh, got into architecture, saw some CAD CAM stuff, decided I had to learn computers, and once I learned more about them, I figured out that that was a pretty good place for me to mix art and technology. And having a little bit of uh, both in my background, that seemed like the right place to go. Gaming was the place to be if you wanted to be pushing graphics. When you think of RTS or real-time strategy titles, it's hard not to think of Command & Conquer as it's seen as one of the most influential titles ever developed. It's easy to see the roots of Command & Conquer in most RTS titles out there and it was unfortunate how EA handled the series in the end. It was inevitable considering EA's track record at that time, and regardless of how you felt by the end, Command & Conquer still remains as one of the best RTS titles ever made. But before looking at the end, let's go back to how the series all began. One of the very first titles that Westwood Studios developed and one that put them on the map to create future RTS games was Dune 2. To many it was their first entry in the genre of strategy video games and went on to become a very good seller. Westwood Studios was based in Las Vegas and in 1992 was bought by Virgin Games which at the time was a good thing. Westwood Studios had based this game of the popular Dune books but felt that they wanted to develop and create their own IP, something they can control and stories that they can craft. With Command and Conquer, what we did was he took this idea of this real-time strategy, the pressure of having to make these strategic decisions, and we wanted to put it into a context which was really accessible to that day. But the story of CNC really came about the, the conflict between good and evil and to cast that evil character at the time, we really wanted to reach into what was at the heart of most people's fears. And at the time, we weren't afraid of, of uh, the Soviets or anything else. We were very much afraid of, the world was afraid of terrorism. And Brett and uh, Edie and Joe came up with this great uh, story idea of, why don't we take this really charismatic, megalomaniacal guy who would gather together a bunch of terrorists and create an organization and take on the world. And of course, that's what CNC is all about, this terrorist organization called the Brotherhood of Nod. And of course, if something existed like that, the world would have to react. And so all the, you, all the Western nations got together and created this GDI, Global Defense Initiative, to combat Kane and the Brotherhood of Nod. This was back in 1995, many years before we have ourselves in our current geo, geopolitical situation. So it was a, it was a bit of uh, fortune telling, as it were. Uh, and I think that's what made it resonate with people, and that's what really made Command & Conquer mean something to people, because it, it felt like it could happen any day, and of course it did. Command & Conquer, or Command & Conquer Tiberian Dawn, as it was known at a later stage, began development in 1992 shortly after the success of Dune 2, 
and took much inspiration from the base building aspect that game had crafted. Taking place in an alternate modern setting, players could make the choice from the beginning to play as the GDI or Brotherhood of Nod, each having their unique mission choices as the game progressed. Unlike other studios who used CG to progress the story between missions, Westwood Studios used FMV or full motion video by capturing some of their own employees acting out as various characters within the game. Fun fact, Joseph Coogan was originally hired at Westwood Studios to be the director of voice talent but ended up portraying the series' iconic character, Kane. I am Kane. Well, I get your troops back from the States, I want you to take what men you have left and secure this abandoned GDI base. Once in, build up an arsenal of weapons and use them to wipe out the remaining GDI presence. Oh, and congratulations on your promotion. Command and Conquer Tiberian Dawn didn't have much competition at that time, aside from a small indie studio known as Silicon and Synapsis. This studio went on to change their name and in 1994 they molded into a little company known as Blizzard Entertainment and during that same year released a title called Warcraft Orcs and Humans. In the age of chaos, two factions battled for dominance. The kingdom of Azeroth was a prosperous one. The humans who dwelt there turned the land into a paradise. The Knights of Stormwind and the Clerics of Norsha Abbey roamed far and wide, serving the king's people with honor and justice. The well-trained armies of the king maintained a lasting peace for many generations. Despite it being a hit, the controls was extremely limited and the minimal sprites used on screen meant that Westwood Studios could potentially have an upper hand with what they were working on. Even the cutscenes of Warcraft were very basic with pixelated art and minimalistic movement. As a test of your abilities, the king has appointed you as regent over a small parcel of land. Since we must keep our armies in the field well supplied, you are to build the town into a Despite the deep rivalry with Blizzard Entertainment, Warcraft Orcs and Humans wasn't much of a competition as Westwood Studios used some elements of CG combined with full motion video to create a B-movie feel to it, something that went on to be iconic throughout the rest of the Command and Conquer games. Speaking of iconic, the resource known as Tiberium that spawned from a meteor which fell from the skies would go on to become an important aspect of the Tiberium saga as it ended up affecting the entire planet in later games. Command and Conquer went on to spawn three universes or sagas known as the Tiberium saga, the Riddler saga and Generals, the latter only spawning one game and one expansion. Going back to the release of Command & Conquer Tiberian Dawn, it finally released in 1995 on PC to a much higher expectation than Westwood Studios could have ever imagined. We are going to have to act if we want to live in a different world. A lot of people didn't think that the game had a lot of possibilities. We had original forecasts in tens of thousands of units, like 60,000 units versus the two plus million that we sold. So uh, it was quite a leap of faith to get that product out. Now once we actually showed it to the public, once we saw the people's eyes light up, once we saw them playing, I think everybody kind of got a hold of the idea that this is something really different, something special, something big. Selling over 3 million units, it was practically a no-brainer that Westwood Studios would want to capitalize on this franchise as it was ported to the Mac, Sega Saturn, PlayStation 1 in 1997 and eventually to the Nintendo 64 in 1999. They knocked it out of the park with its sleek controls, unit movement and AI but more importantly the incredible soundtrack by Frank Kaplacki.
At that time, it was rare to find a game with such a solid soundtrack that would become memorable for decades to come. Westwood Studios also expanded on Command and Conquer in 1996 for the PC version with an expansion pack titled The Covert Operations, which provided even more missions for both GDI and the Brotherhood of Nod in addition to a Jurassic Park themed mission. Yes, we saw dinosaurs in Command and Conquer. Multiplayer and online was in its infant stages, even though Command & Conquer had an online mode. Blizzard Entertainment saw the potential and capitalized on their franchise with Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness. It had better controls, more unit variety, a better soundtrack, but that didn't stop for what was to come. Westwood Studios was hitting it out of the park and it wasn't long before they revealed what was next for the Command & Conquer franchise. In 1996, Westwood Studios released the first spin-off from the Command & Conquer series and one that would become even more popular than the original, titled Command & Conquer Red Alert. Taking the same core elements from Tiberian Dawn, Red Alert turned back time to World War II and took an alternate approach where Hitler was killed thanks to time travel which altered the course of future events and saw the rose in power of the USSR. Throughout the story of Red Alert, Kane would make an appearance and as it was later revealed, Red Alert was originally planned to be a prequel of sorts to Command & Conquer Tiberian Dawn, where Kane would plant the seeds that would eventually become the rise of the Brotherhood of Nod. This was eventually retconned in some way in later Red Alert games. As with the prior title, you could also choose between two factions, Allies and Soviet, but if you played through the Soviet campaign, then that would lead to the inevitable rise of the Brotherhood of Nod. However, further Red Alert titles proceeded as if the Allied had won, thus completely moving away from the Tiberian Saga and separating those two from each other in future titles. First, the reason we really were inspired to create Red Alert was uh, fans wanted more. People wanted more Command and & Conquer and you know, we clearly couldn't put the kind of number of years into the product to sort of start from scratch and build a whole new thing. So what we figured was, hey, we could take the basic mechanics of the game, create all new sides, all new units, all new balancing, and um, you know change the graphics to some extent, but we really needed a new theme. A lot of people don't know that Red Alert was actually an expansion pack to CNC, and it was supposed to be kind of this alternate kind of command and conquer thing, and then they ended up thinking that it was so good that they made it a standalone product. Red Alert was also ported a year later to the PlayStation 1 and the success of this title led to not only one but two expansion packs. The first pack being titled Counter-Strike introduced new maps, missions and units for both factions as well as a secret ant mission which, you guessed it, tasks you to take out the giant ants. The aftermath introduced much of the same with new units and missions for both factions and further increased the sales for the Command & Conquer franchise. The two expansions were eventually bundled together and also ported to the PlayStation 1 in 1998 with exclusive FMV cutscenes and to this day, Red Alert Retaliation remains a fan favorite amongst the console ports. Westwood Studios felt that they wanted to create something unique and different using the formula of Command & Conquer and as such the birth of an online only game titled Command & Conquer Soul Survivor was released to very mixed response. It featured a deathmatch style game in which each player controls any unit of the original Command & Conquer including the dinosaurs and you move around the game arena collecting crates to increase the unit's firepower 
armor, speed, attack range and reloading speed. Soul Survivor was often compared to a third person shooter, however played with a top down perspective of the arena. It featured no single player mode aside from an offline and limited practice mode and the multiplayer had no hints of a storyline. It was also not included in the collection packs of Command & Conquer and to this day it is very hard to find any gameplay of Soul Survivor. Command & Conquer blew everybody away, it had little to no competition and dominated the RTS scene. Westwood Studios was on top but that all changed in 1998 when a little strategy game was released. Some might know it as Warcraft in space but it is more formally known as Starcraft. Three factions, tight controls, incredible AI, a kick-ass soundtrack and an online mode that would redefine online gaming as we know it, Blizzard Entertainment completely dominated the gaming scene as a whole and rewrote the way strategy games would evolve. Westwood Studios knew that they had to go back to their strategy roots and as such expanded to the story of where it all began. However, some troubles started stirring behind the scenes and in 1998, Electronic Arts bought Westwood Studios for around $120 million. Perhaps Electronic Arts saw what Blizzard had developed and said, we want our own StarCraft and thus they thought buying Westwood Studios would lead to a money making machine. EA had full creative control over the Command & Conquer franchise and to this day they still hold the rights to this beloved franchise. According to the Command & Conquer wiki, many staff from Westwood Studios was unhappy about this move and eventually left the company shortly after this purchase. It didn't take long though before Westwood Studios released their first Command & Conquer game under the EA umbrella and it fell within the Tiberium universe and took place around the year 2030 expanding the battle between the GDI and Nod. Command & Conquer Tiberian Sun was the second game within the Tiberian saga and took the sci-fi elements of the game even further. It was in Tiberium Sun where the elements of Tiberium became more relevant as it began to overtake many areas of the planet, making it a more important part of the story than within the first game. We've come to find out that the Tiberium substance that everybody had looked to as this great savior for helping to get natural resources has some really nasty side effects and in fact is terraforming the planet. And the question is, for what? What the hell is this? What does Cain have? What is this Tacitus? Tiberium isn't an accident. It's something that was sent by an intelligent race and it's the, the precursor to an invasion. What happened to the technology that you and Cain stole off that UFO? So all of Tiberium Sun is all about um, Nod, the Brotherhood of Nod, this terrorist organization which has now evolved to a technological um, group that, that really embraces the strange mutations that Tiberium is causing and is trying to create super soldiers. My judgment is sound, Cain, and I'm not afraid of ghosts or you. A new graphic engine was introduced which allowed for more elements and higher resolution to appear on screen and in addition to choosing your faction in the beginning, bonus missions was also unlocked based on different objectives completed within each mission. Tiberian Sun was released in 1999 just before the start of the new millennium and CG elements also saw a big improvement. With EA in the control of things, that also meant that Westwood Studios had a bigger budget at hand that resulted in some more notable actors to appear in the FMVs instead of requiring the staff to act out certain characters. Computers had come a long way, they were much more powerful, so we were really able to explore the three-dimensional aspects of the world, the characters, the, the units themselves take tanks that were now hovercraft and, and you know the orca flyers that became orca bombers and all sorts of cool things like that. Just all this imaginative stuff that came out of the science fiction of the mixture of the alien technology along with these, these uh, you know, sort of evolution of war machines. So all this stuff put together made for lots of different ways to play and well over double the number of types of units you had. Tiberian Sun saw the return of Joseph Coogan as Kane, but unfortunately none of the previous actors returned. Tiberian Sun had somewhat of a troubled development. With EA at the helm, they had a very tight deadline and some elements never made it into the final version. Tiberian Sun was initially planned to be a battle mech game set in the final weeks of Command & Conquer, but eventually went back to being a strategy game. 
it also had a loadout screen in development but never made it to the final product. Some of Tiberian Sun's advertised features such as intelligent and adaptive skirmish AI, unit veterancy and real-time lighting were severely scaled back as a result of time constraints. Despite setbacks and performance issues, Tiberian Sun was received very positively by the audience and became an instant hit. So when we first shipped Tiberian Sun, I remember being absolutely astounded. We had shipped well over a million copies into the trade. Uh, literally within the first few days around the world and there were reorders before we even finished shipping the, some of the different places so we literally within a week went through over a million copies which was just phenomenal due to its success westwood studios or should i say ea brought out the first and only expansion titled tiberian sun firestorm so as we finished up tiberian sun and we were working on our next product and uh, which which ultimately became uh, red alert 2 um, we really wanted to make sure that the expansion pack on this product did something a little different. So we added a third side through the expansion pack, which was the first time we actually had done that, and that side was Cabal. Here was this artificial intelligence created by Kane, and uh, really was supposed to be like a master control computer that would help him wage battles, but it, it, got, it became sentient and ended up running the show all on its own. So here was this, this strange allegiance between Nod and GDI who are bitter enemies, but recognizing that this thing was actually more dangerous and, and potentially more, more damaging than either one of them could be. So they had a, a sort of very strange and brief alliance to try to put down Cabal. And it made for a great storyline in Firestorm. And some of the missions were the, the most exciting and the most challenging missions of any of the mission packs ever made for a Command & Conquer game. Set after the events of the GDI campaign, Firestorm added new missions for both factions, new units, bug fixes and brought in some features that was planned for the original title but never made it in time due to its troubled development. Cabal was a new enemy that caused a threat for both the GDI and Nod which resulted in a temporarily ceasefire where both factions had to work together to defeat this new threat. It didn't take long for Westwood to return to the Red Alert saga as later in 2000 we saw the release of Command & Conquer Red Alert 2. Red Alert 2 used the same engine as Tiberian Sun, but it had many improvements. Still taking place in an alternate history, 1972 to be exact, as well as the Soviet fighting the Allied forces, Red Alert 2 introduced a new villain who had mind control abilities. If time travel wasn't crazy enough, now you had mind control. Yuri was a favorite villain amongst fans and had a big impact through the campaign. Multiplayer saw an improvement in terms of allowing players to choose different nations from each faction which gave you the ability to have unique units. Some units within Red Alert 2 also had two functions which further enhanced the way you play. Well, with Red Alert 2, um, things really got exciting in the Red Alert universe. Not only do we have all the weird signs from the original Red Alert, but we had sort of gotten religion and the guys down in Irvine um, really outdid themselves to make two sides that were really, really different. And I was just absolutely blown away by it. I was a big fan of Red Alert 1, but this one just took everything that was great about Red Alert 1 and like cranked it tenfold. It was super fast paced. Red Alert 2 had units like, you know, mind controlled dolphins and squids and, and psychic soldiers and... See how the American President Duke and Ducks were coming! <laughs> This is the, cause. the actual story themselves, the video, we had really yeah, become much better at storytelling. So although it was very campy and very intentionally so, um, the, the production quality on the video pieces and all the, all the um, actors and sets was way above and beyond anything we had done to, to date. Um, the characters that they got um, were unbelievably funny and they were acted, overacted in such hilarious ways. The costumes were phenomenal the sets and props, etc. Red Alert 2 ended up being a critical success and it was followed up with an expansion titled Yuri's Revenge which saw the return of Yuri and also allowed him to be a third playable faction in multiplayer. 
It also included new units for each faction, as well as more missions throughout the campaign. With the addition of Yuri's Revenge to Red Alert 2, I think really the Irvine team pretty much perfected real-time strategy in its, in its time. Uh, Yuri's Revenge added a third side that was yet again completely different from the other two sides. So these units could combine, the IFDs could actually, you could take one unit and stick it inside another unit and change its functionality. And there were so many different possible combinations that it felt like you were constantly uh, discovering new units that could be used in the battlefield. Curious fact, after the tragic 9-11 attack, EA had to change the box art of Red Alert 2 as it originally included the burning twin towers in the background. As tradition occurs, the next Command & Conquer game was supposedly returning to the Tiberi universe and, well, it did, but it wasn't what fans expected. For the millions of Command & Conquer fans around the world, we got a present for you. Reinforcements en route. Hand of Nod under attack. Command & Conquer Renegade is a first-person shooter released in 2002 and set in the Tiberium Saga where you play the role of Nick Havoc Parker, a GDI commando. Taking place during the First Tiberium War, you essentially set out to rescue a scientist and fight the Brotherhood of Nod. Despite mixed reviews, the game was still received well even though it was the first FPS title Westwood Studios had ever developed. From the very first Command & Conquer there was this character, which was the Commando, and he really was just like six pixels high, but he had these great voice bits, these little clips, like, I got a present for you, and uh, you know, that was left-handed. They had this all this attitude, this sort of Rambo-esque attitude. And so from that very moment, we had decided we wanted to one day do a game all about the Commando. And that's what Renegade was, was all about, was this one character from our Command & Conquer universe in the Command & Conquer world and how he could make a difference in the battles. And that's what Command & Conquer Renegade was, was really set out to do, was to let you fully explore what it was like to be the Commando in the Command & Conquer universe. We need those reinforcements yesterday. It's a fantastic game. It was all about you going through the world and discovering what horrors Nod had created and being able to turn around and uh, defeat them sort of single-handed. It was just unfortunate that this ended up being the last Command & Conquer game we'll ever see from Westwood Studios. In 2002, another title was released by Westwood Studios. Earth and Beyond was an MMORPG set in a sci-fi universe but was closed two years after launch due to poor reception and it would also be the final title released by Westwood Studios as EA Games hit the nail in the coffin and shut down the legendary studio not long after the game's release. EA never ended up getting their own StarCraft. Over the years, it was revealed that Westwood Studios had more plans to expand the Command & Conquer franchise with cancelled titles such as Command & Conquer Renegade 2, which saw you in the role of a different person which took place in the universe of Red Alert 2. Apparently that was going to connect the Tiberium universe with Red Alert in some way, but I guess we'll never know because eventually it was scrapped in favor of EA's Battlefront titles and as such very few footage of it existed online. Command & Conquer Continuum was to be Westwood's second MMORPG after Earth & Beyond. It was developed on the Westwood 3D engine and it was cancelled due to the termination of Westwood Studios in 2003. It was to feature a moving and involving Tiberian world where the player could play a great role in the entire story. The GDI, Nod, Mutants and Cabal were to be major factions with the screen to be added later. Prominent locations included a half-submerged Los Angeles, Area 51, Dino Island, Newark Airport, a mutant city and other locations. 
Command and Conquer Tiberian Incursion was the working title for what was to be Westwood's third Tiberian game, which was going to feature the arrival of the Skrin. An event planned for the game was the creation of Riddler 2's universe due to the use of time travel, but this was rejected. Some elements of the cancelled game were included in Tiberium Wars, which we all knew was eventually the third game in the Tiberium universe. Command and Conquer would see a shift in gears since Westwood Studios no longer existed, however EA Pacific had some staff of former Westwood Studios and they would essentially be helming the franchise going forward. The staff was hard at work on a third Command and Conquer title within the Tiberium universe, despite the cancellation of Tiberium Incursion. However, EA had plans to push the franchise into a 3D engine, which saw a more modern and realistic setting with the release of Command & Conquer Generals in 2003. In the modern world, great leaders resolve their conflicts with words. Three factions were introduced, China, US and Global Liberation Army or GLA. The shift to a 3D engine saw the removal of full motion videos and generals didn't have a concrete story like some of the other Command & Conquer titles. The GLA was essentially terrorists who wanted to take over the world, while China and US were the only two factions that stood up against them. Each faction had their unique units, tech trees and buildings including Campaign, which was much shorter than previous Command & Conquer games. It was our first opportunity to bring Command & Conquer as a franchise into the 3D world. Finally, we had 3D hardware that could actually generate these huge cities with shadows and characters and tons of hundreds of units all battling it all out at the same time. It was, it was so compelling to us that we decided to really try to tell the entire story from the point of view of the game engine. And that was what was when uh, Sage was created, the actual game engine that we, we still uh, continue to evolve to this day. Generals was received critically well and sold good enough for EA to push for an expansion pack that very same year. Generals Zero Hour saw the introduction of the general system where each faction had multiple generals to choose from each bringing unique aspects to each faction. Multiplayer was improved and generals are still looked at as one of the better Command & Conquer titles despite never really getting a sequel, but more on that in a moment. The actual characterization of your forces was a reflection of the general style and so when you were playing against a particular type of general you really knew what kind of tactics and strategies they might use. So there would be a stealth general and there would be a toxin general and a laser general and we took all those generals and kind of strung together a campaign called General's Challenge where you would face each of them. Um, that campaign allowed us to kind of go back to that Red Alert 2 days of a little bit craziness, a little bit of campiness. It was from here that the Command & Conquer franchise started shifting hands like a hot potato. EA Pacific, who had been working mostly on the Command & Conquer series, was folded into EA Los Angeles and they would be responsible for all RTS titles going forward. Unfortunately, I could not find much info on how this affected the remaining Westwood staff, but from what I could find, not many of them stayed after this move. It was during 2003 and shortly after the closure of Westwood Studios, where most of the remaining staff went on to form their own studio, Petroglyph Games. It didn't take long for that studio to strike a deal, as they were responsible for titles such as Star Wars Empire at War, Universe at War, Panzer General and Grey Goo, but to name a few. Petroglyph Games, or those people who started Westwood Studios, never got a chance to touch the Command & Conquer franchise again, but more on that at a later point. One year prior to the release of Generals, the old rivals of Westwood had released Warcraft 3 and well, I don't really need to go into much detail on what that game did to the gaming industry as a whole. 
not only did the game fundamentally change online gaming, but their map editor spawned a new genre of gaming with Dota and absolutely destroyed the esports scene with Warcraft 3 plus its expansion, who went on to win multiple awards. Command & Conquer was nowhere to be seen. It went completely silent and many wondered what had happened to Command & Conquer if EA would ever return to this franchise. Around 2006, ex Westwood staff who founded Petroglyph Games released Star Wars Empire at War which is still played and modded to this day. It seemed that the Command & Conquer was dead. No word or rumor sparked on what was going on. It took a couple of years but it was only during 2007, four years after the release of Generals that we would see another Command & Conquer game, this time returning to the Tiberium universe. Philadelphia uplink successful. Welcome back, Commander. Today's threat level is low. The state of the planet is deteriorating. Tiberium infestation has reached critical levels. Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars was finally released in 2007, which introduced the Skrin faction alongside GDI and Nod. The Skrin is an alien faction that was planned for a very long time and taking place in 2047. Kane was presumed dead after the Second Tiberium War but returned to lead Nod in the battle against the GDI. A dramatic Tiberium liquid explosion is what caused the arrival of the Skrin as it makes for an interesting change within the gameplay. As with any Command & Conquer game, Tiberium Wars introduced new units and abilities alongside the return of full motion video. The Skrin only became a playable faction once you completed both the Nod and GDI campaigns. One of the major elements of Tiberium Wars was the introduction of battle cast where players can spectate a multiplayer match and cast over the game while others were playing. EA Games heavily promoted this within the esports scene hoping to compete against their competition. Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars was a hit and EA was happy enough to push for an expansion in 2008 titled Kane's Wrath. Aside from the traditional introduction of new units, sub-factions, maps and abilities, a new mode called Global Conquest was also introduced. This mode is more a turn-based element where one player tries to defeat the other player and take over the world. It was a fun and interesting take on the franchise and one that was definitely seen in some of EA's other RTS titles at the time such as the Battle for Middle-Earth franchise also developed by EA Los Angeles. EA was hoping to somehow boost their image within the public and thus allow developers to have more creative freedom over their titles. Not only did we see games such as Mirror's Edge and Dead Space, but in Kane's Wrath we got super units which are gigantic units that take up a massive part of the screen and can easily take out an enemy base by itself. It was weird and wacky but man did fans love it. Command & Conquer 3 Tiberium Wars and Kane's Wrath was also ported to the Xbox 360 one year later. EA knew they had a winning formula on their hands. EA knew that they had a winning formula on their hands as well as an engine that worked for strategy titles and it was during this time that EA became hungry for more. However, unfortunately another cancelled game fell under the franchise of Command & Conquer. How the hell did we get here? Mankind on the verge of extinction. And after all these years, all we've really learned is the unthinkable. That we are not the only world fighting for Tiberium. Tiberium was to be a tactical first-person shooter set in the Command & Conquer universe that was in development by EA Los Angeles. Tiberium was initially revealed when shots of the 2008 January issue of Game Informer was leaked but was officially announced by EA just a day after. Prior to the announcement, the game had been in production for two years. The plot would have revolved around a repeat of the screen invasion, however shown from the eyes of a GDI commando. 
In the first previews of the game by GameSpot and IGN, it was confirmed that Tiberium used a game engine based on Unreal Engine 3. It would have been, to this date, the only Command & Conquer game not to include Command & Conquer in its title. Tiberium was cancelled on September the 30th in the same year due to the game's failure to meet quality standards set by the development team and the EA Games label, something we are all too familiar with today. It was the beginning of a path which led to numerous cancelled Command & Conquer projects. Project Camacho was planned as a real-time strategy first-person shooter hybrid set in the Command & Conquer Generals universe, but it was cancelled in 2008. Little is known about the story, but judging from the concept art, it was to be set after the People's Republic of China invades mainland USA successfully, featuring a group of ragtag American survivors of the invasion trying to combat the Chinese occupants by any means necessary. With two cancelled Command & Conquer games, many wondered where the franchise was headed and sadly, this was foreshadowing for what was to come. However, in 2008, we saw the return to the Red Alert universe with Command & Conquer Red Alert 3. EA used the same engine they used with Tiberium Wars in addition to multiple graphical updates and not only did we see the return of Soviet and Allied, but also the new addition of the Empire of the Rising Sun. Taking place during the mid-80s, the USSR was on the brink of destruction and used time travel to travel back in time and kill Einstein, who was vital to the victory of the Allied forces. This caused an alternate timeline which saw the rise of the new empire. Each faction was unique in their own way and had units and abilities which differentiate vastly from one another. Red Alert 3 was also designed around co-op play where you can play the entire campaign with a friend or another AI partner. Naval combat was also another major focus for Red Alert 3, with each side receiving an extensive range of naval units and buildings. Additionally, every unit had an ability which the player had to micromanage, thus causing more strategic planning or frustration depending on how you look at it. One year later, EA released the expansion to Red Alert 3 titled Uprising, which saw new campaigns and units for each faction, as well as a fourth campaign, which focused around Yuriku, the Empire's psychic commando. Why she is not wearing underwear, I have no idea. Additionally, Uprising saw the addition of the Commander's Challenge, which was loosely based around the challenges from General Zero Hour and contained about 50 challenges, each tasking you to think outside the box to defeat the different generals. EA was happy with the sales of Red Alert 3 and its expansion, and they ported both versions to the Xbox 360 as well as the PlayStation 3. Through backwards compatibility, you can actually play Command & Conquer Tiberium Wars, its expansion, as well as Red Alert 3 on the Xbox One. According to the Command & Conquer wiki, Red Alert 3 came with secure ROM on PC which caused a nightmare for many as it limited the number of times you can install Red Alert 3 but soon after it was removed due to fan backlash and before it came to Steam. Thankfully, I only installed it at one PC on that time. One year later, the old rival of Command & Conquer came back to haunt them with the release of StarCraft 2 and it completely took the world by storm dominating yet again in the esports scene and completely conquering the real-time strategy space. No pun intended. It didn't take long for EA to cancel yet another Command & Conquer game. This time EA tried to go back to the multiplayer only aspect much like the one Westwood Studios did with Soul Survivor.
Command & Conquer Arena was planned as a multiplayer-oriented spin-off of Tiberium Wars and Kane's Wrath, set in the Tiberium universe. The game featured the tagline, The war is over, but the battle continues. The storyline followed the ascension of Kane and involved a subsequent Skrin invasion and enslavement of Earth. This title was aimed mostly at the Asian market but didn't make past the initial alpha stage and was eventually scrapped and transformed into something that was the beginning of the end for what we know as Command & Conquer. In 2010, we saw the fall of a once mighty franchise with the release of Command & Conquer 4, Tiberium Twilight. The planet is dying. Our alliance is fragile. My ascension... My ascension draws near. The core mechanics of what made Command & Conquer great were no longer there. The heart, the soul of the franchise was gone. The Skrin, who was an important aspect to the Tiberium Saga, was now reduced to an NPC faction. Base building, let me repeat that, base building was removed in favor of this, a class-based walking structure known as the Mobile Construction Vehicle or MCVs. You still have Nod and GDI to choose from, but at the start of the mission you can select between three different MCVs, offense, defense or support, and that would determine your options and units through that particular mission. So we have... Um a new class-based gameplay, there's a, uh, three classes that you can play as. The first class is the offense class, and that's primarily ground-based units that upgrade as you play the game. The next class is the defense class, and it's the class that can place structures into the map. It places defensive structures like shield generators and stealth uh, generators. It can also place weapons as turrets into, the, into uh, a mission, so you'll get laser turrets and machine guns and a bunch of other structures as well. And the units they primarily use is infantry and powered armor. And then the third class class is the support class. The support class deals with air-based units and is the class that can buff and heal other units, not only its units but the units of its allies. And besides buffing and healing, it also can um, use global powers. It's the only class that can use an ion cannon or a nuclear missile. This means that you'll be limited by the number of units you can build because you'll only have one MCV, thus playing a match of 2 vs 1 or 3 vs 1 is near impossible because for every unit you build, your enemy will build 3 times that at once. I remember distinctly one particular mission where I had to defeat 3 AI enemies at once and it took me over 2 hours just to complete that mission because I kept being overrun by enemies no matter what I did. It took most of the strategy elements out of the game as you no longer have to defeat the enemies but capture certain points. That also means that if you have other 2 AI enemies, they move double as fast as you which resulted in even more frustration. EA also introduced a leveling system for online play which unlocked more units the higher level you were. So for example, if you just started out, then you can only build basic units because you are at a low level. The problem with this is that if you battle against a higher level player, then you are immediately screwed because they can build better units than you can and you are stuck with low level units through that entire match. It's such an idiotic choice and I'm baffled why EA made this choice. You essentially had to grind your way to level up against AI or you're forced to play co-op with a friend to be helped through the game as not to be outnumbered. What made this even worse was the online requirement. Yes, you had to be always connected to the internet to play Command & Conquer even if you're just playing the campaign mode. Many games had that implemented during that time to combat piracy, but for fans of the Command & Conquer franchise, this was a complete deal breaker. Not only that, but the story overall was lacking. God was the clever writing and despite Joe Coogan returning one last time as Kane, it was a complete letdown for his character and the Tiberian saga as a whole. The conclusion to an incredible 15 year story ended with this.
Please don't leave me, please. You said he would be fine. I thought he would be. But you're too fragile. You're all so fragile. Command and Conquer 4 is a game that we're calling the epic conclusion of the Tiberium Saga. In this game, we're going to answer all the mysteries that we have brought to the game series over the last 14 years, and we're going to introduce a new mystery, and that mystery is why is Kane working with GDI? Kane, as the leader of the Brotherhood of Nod, have always been diametrically opposed to GDI. Overall, the gameplay was worse than its predecessor, with visual effects not nearly looking as good as Tiberium Wars and the sound design taking a major step back. Command & Conquer 4 Tiberium Twilight was a disappointment to many and it was the downfall of the franchise as a whole. Originally, Tiberium Twilight was planned as a mobile game and it absolutely shows. Following the terrible reception of Tiberium Twilight, EA Los Angeles was eventually rebranded as Danger Close Games who became responsible for the Medal of Honor series, but it wasn't all doom and gloom for the Command & Conquer franchise, right? Right? Earlier I mentioned that fans wanted a sequel to Generals 2 and in 2011 EA announced Command & Conquer Generals 2 with the banner of Bioware during that initial teaser, however it wasn't the Bioware we know today as it was under the label Bioware Victory which was later rebranded as Victory Games. It was almost too good to be true as Generals 2 was meant to revive this franchise and bring it back to its roots with base building and what made Command & Conquer great. In 2012, however, it was announced that the name or content of Generals 2 would be dropped and the game would simply be called Command & Conquer. The game looked good despite the unfortunate news of Generals 2, but it was revealed later on that the game would have no campaign and that it would become a free-to-play online multiplayer only game. Today we see games such as Fortnite and Apex Legends dominating charts, but back then that was something that the fans didn't want. But blinded by our hubris, we fail to see the ghosts from the past rising anew, sworn to end our supremacy. We are now besieged from all sides, all that we stand for at risk. In an attempt to win back fans, Victory Games stated that in 2014, Command & Conquer would see the release of downloadable campaign missions, but unfortunately, due to negative feedback, the game was eventually cancelled in 2013 and EA also closed Victory Games on that same day. On November of 2013, EA announced that they'd be working on a brand new Command & Conquer game with a new studio controlling the wheel, but as of today, there has been no further announcement about that. There was a few other Command & Conquer games released during that time, all of which seemed to be the reason why EA hit the nail in the coffin of this beloved franchise. In 2012, EA Phenomic released Command & Conquer Tiberium Alliances, which is a free-to-play browser-based game taking a huge downgrade on the franchise. I never play that version, but doing some research, I found that each player will first select a sector on the world map and start their base there. The base will be protected from any attacks exactly for one week, but will go unprotected if the owner attacks another player prior to that time ending. From there, players can then advance his or her base further through construction, gathering or combat. 
There are several resources used in this game. There are Tiberium, Crystal, Power, Credit and Resource Points. Tiberium is used for base construction, Crystal is used to produce infantry, tanks and air and upgrade manned defense units. Power is used for both base construction and military unit upgrades. Credit is used to transfer Tiberium and Crystal between bases. It is also used along with research points to research new units and structures for base advancement and also new MCVs which are deployed to create new bases. During this research, it was found that Red Alert Alliances was also in development at that time but was eventually cancelled. According to the wiki, Command & Conquer Red Alert Alliances is a cancelled free-to-play browser mobile game developed by EA Phenomic. It was set in the Red Alert universe, primarily focusing on units and structure design from the War of the Three Powers. Only the Allies, Soviet and the Empire of the Rising Sun are visible in the provided screenshots. It was to have a similar gameplay to Command & Conquer Tiberium Alliances. In 2013, EA eventually closed EA Phenomic, a pattern we would be all too familiar with. Surprisingly though, Command & Conquer Tiberium Alliances is still active and can be played to this day as it's being supported by Envision Entertainment who is somewhat made up of former staff from EA Phenomic. How long will they stay active? Time will tell. Command & Conquer was seemingly dead. There was no word from EA what happened with that mysterious announcement of a new Command & Conquer nor was there any word about the franchise returning in any form. That all changed in 2018. Hello ladies and gentlemen, I'm Nathanius, professional shoutcaster, here alongside Redwood Studios General Manager Michael Martinez. How are you doing today? I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, we're going to do this presentation a little bit differently and give you your first look at a brand new mobile game in a live winner take all head to head match. During the E3 2018 EA presentation, EA came out to talk about a new game and many fans were unsure of what exactly they were talking about. They showed two people playing a mobile game on stage and many tried to figure out what it was until the title revealed it to be a Command & Conquer game titled Command & Conquer Rivals, which is a, you guessed it, a free-to-play mobile version of Command & Conquer set in the Tiberium universe. Command & Conquer Wiki says that the game involves GDI and NOT forces facing off against each other on a single screen in 1 vs 1. Each side has access to a variety of commanders which provided different bonuses for their players' forces. Forces are commanded in real time. Every battlefield is divided into a number of hexagons, each of which can be occupied by a single unit. For most units, only enemies in an adjacent hex can be attacked. There is a delay between moving to a hex and opening fire, so defenders tend to have an advantage. The game was under development by some former EA Los Angeles staff, but quickly thereafter on Twitter, the trend Not My CNC was trending all over, and although the developers noticed the backlash, they kindly asked players to try the game out themselves before giving it a bad score. You can still download Command & Conquer Rivals at this moment on your mobile device. But what about the Red Alert franchise? Also, during 2018, it was revealed that Red Alert Online was released in the Chinese market only for mobile devices from none other than Tencent in association of EA Games. It is, in essence, a mobile version of Red Alert 2, combining some elements of generals into that game. Since it's only available for the Chinese market, it is extremely difficult to get this game working outside of that market and it has yet to hit main markets as not many are aware of this title, however this was definitely the final nail in the coffin and the death of Command & Conquer. So where does this leave the core Command & Conquer franchise? It has been 25 years since the release and birth of a legendary franchise, one that lived and died. You can argue who was responsible for the inevitable death. Was it the publisher? Did the franchise not evolve alongside the market or was the ambition of the franchise just too high during its time? 
I say that because we know how well a free to play game like Fortnite or Apex is doing at this moment and it requires you to be always online yet when an always online free to play game was announced back in 2013 nobody wanted it. Had Fortnite been released in 2013 it might have received a similar fate but there was light at the end of the tunnel. There were talks, rumblings of a franchise being reborn a rebirth of a legend, a remaster of Command and Conquer. Towards the end of 2018, Jim Vassella, who is not only the current creative director at EA Games, but also worked on prior Command & Conquer games such as Tiberium Wars, Kane's Wrath, Riddler 3 and Tiberium Twilight, announced on Reddit that EA, in partner with Petroglyph Games, are working on a 4K remaster of Command & Conquer. This made fans both hopeful and worried. Jim stated in detail how they would be tackling this huge project using core elements and code from their original Command & Conquer game to keep the game as authentic as possible and to the surprise of many, they would be partnering with Petroglyph Games, who consists of ex-Westwood Studio staff to bring back this beloved franchise. It was also revealed that this remaster would include Command & Conquer Tiberian Dawn, its expansion as well as Red Alert, plus both those expansions. It is a huge undertaking, but with EA still being attached, one of the very first questions asked was about microtransactions and monetization. Prior to that year, EA fell under the sights of many due to the backlash they received about Star Wars Battlefront 2, but thankfully Jim immediately addressed that stating that there would be zero microtransactions at all. Over the course of the years since its announcement, EA provided us with many information as well as art assets of this remaster, stating that they even got the original composer back to re-record much of the music and some voice actors will be reprising their roles to keep the game as authentic as possible. EA also released a gameplay tease which clearly shows us how the game has changed and it is the first time you'll be able to zoom in and out of the original Command & Conquer games. In early 2020, EA revealed the first information about the multiplayer portion of Command & Conquer Remaster, stating that it will be built on the petroglyph architecture and feature replays as well as the ability to shoutcast, something all too familiar in Tiberium Wars. New modes will also be introduced for the first time in Red Alert and Tiberian Dawn, in addition to the game being fully supported in 4K resolution, but at the time of this video, no official release date has been given. Command & Conquer is reborn and many fans are highly anticipating the release of this remaster, but some concerns are still rumbling among fans as EA left a bad taste in the mouth of gamers, especially with Battlefront 2 and the more recent Anthem. However, with Petroglyph Games or the ex-Westwood Studio staff being in the control of the majority portion of Command & Conquer remaster, it has me hopeful because the care and passion that started this beloved franchise returned to bring back Command & Conquer. During my research of this video, I was surprised at how much the franchise changed hands and uncovered many aspects of the cancelled games that would make very interesting content on their own, so I may explore those areas further in separate videos. Most of my facts and information come from old interviews, wiki pages and development diaries, but if any detail were incorrect then please state that in the comments below. It is interesting that EA never touched on that unannounced Command & Conquer game which they spoke about back in 2013 and I do wonder if this will turn into an entirely new Command & Conquer for the next generation of gaming. Time will tell. Sooner or later, time will tell. But if you made it to the end of this video then I thank you for sticking with me through this long and comprehensive look at Command & Conquer. 
Let me know in the comments below what you thought of this video and also how many times I said the name Command & Conquer. If you enjoy this type of content then please leave me a like as it is super appreciated and for more Command & Conquer news check out the rest of my channel. If you like this video then give me a thumbs up, if you dislike it then give me a thumbs down, but please tell me why so I can improve my videos. My name is Frank, I'm the Red Side Guy, and frankly, thank you for watching. Catch you guys in the next video.